watch Captain Kangaroo. Well, you know, life's full of You guys smell that? I think I can, yeah. That's uh, the unmistakable steak. Stink. For a Friday. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another edition of a Friday morning live stream in which I talk about whatever I want. A bunch of random nonsense. Horse crap piled on top of each other. My name is Justin Robert Young, uh, and this is my podcast. Well, I guess it's not a podcast yet. It will be a podcast, eventually. Uh, we're going to put it over together as the teal deer and uh if i can remember which subreddit people were nice enough to set up then uh, i'll be able to read stories from it i'll do that in the next break uh i've the the chat has been uh, a real pain in the balls but you know normally i I have a a list of stories national stories that I, i would like to talk about because that was kind of the idea for this podcast was you know give me an opportunity number one to do a one mic show um, where it's different with a co-host than it is with, with one mic. And you would think that the difference is that you just kind of talk to yourself as opposed to talk to somebody else. And I guess that, in essence, is true. The difference is making that interesting. <laughs> you know, everybody has had interesting conversations with people. So when you're listening to something, you're putting it in the context of, well, that's interesting. That was like that one time that me and my friend talked, and it was interesting. Not many times do, for many of us, do we say, man, remember that one great time I had listening to myself talk for three hours? So therein lies the talent. To try and do something where it's just one guy blathering on and on is, uh, you know, something different, something I wanted to try. It's earlier here on the West Coast. That's why I'm rambling. But normally I have national stories. Normally I have stories that I want to run down and talk about because I feel like I have something interesting to say about them. Whether or not that's true is kind of up to you guys. But this week, I don't really need stories. I have, I have a really... Uh, for those of you who are just listening right now, um, I when I started this particular live stream, I was not living in Oakland, California. I was living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, I have since taken another job in California, and that job is the Go Game. What is the Go Game? The Go Game is a company that puts on, I mean, I would say scavenger hunts, but I've done a couple things since I last uh, came on and did this show that were not scavenger hunts. We did one, I left here and did a dance mob in Chrissy Field. I've never been to Chrissy Field. I'm a newbie to all this San Francisco stuff. But uh, we we did we organized a bunch of I think it was like 400 people that did like this dance and everything, and it was it was pretty cool. But people basically came to the Go Game because the Go Game's good at organizing random nonsense. If you need random nonsense, the more random the better. I need four pieces of cheese taped to a mule and run up and down the street. Yeah, get the go game on the phone. Um, that's that's what it is. That that's what this company is. And then Tuesday, we flew out to Dallas. We being me and Brett Brownsville, who is my coworker and roommate now, the Amtrekker, as many of you may know. And uh, we put on what is called a movie game. Now, I I don't know what, uh, if there's like a proprietary element to this, but I'll explain basically that the movie game is a bunch of people filming a short movie. In this case, it was uh, a company that has a national sales meeting. And normally what they had done in the past is just had a kind of very staid affair. A very, let's all pile into a hotel ballroom. We'll fly everybody in. Some of the guys can cheat on their wives. I'm sure nobody from this company, but other companies that have very state affairs. I'm sure those guys cheated on their wives constantly. 
Because that's what they do on business trips. They're like, I want to do two things on this business trip. Get a mug for my child and cheat the hell on my wife. Whoo! That's how much I'm going to cheat on my wife. And there's a bunch of guys sitting around a table, a bunch of fat dudes with cigars, looking at each other in the eye and going, Whoo! Did I cheat on my wife last night? Oh, let me tell you how much I cheated on my wife. Bushels and bunches. Ooh. That's old me. Bushels and bunches, Jones. Um, so it was normally a very state affair. It was normally just basically a get-together where they talked about goals and upcoming things. And A couple years ago, they wanted to kind of gussy it up, make it more of an event. And so they built on that each year until this year. They hired the Go Game, which was the best move ever, because hiring the Go Game is a good idea. Me and Brett flew down to Dallas. We put on this movie game. Now, that is the what. This is the how. It was nothing but one planes, trains, and automobiles moment. Leaving from here, San Francisco, to Dallas. Just boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. One after another. One cock up after another. We get on the f first, all right. So first, night before, we're like, getting a little paranoid because we got a lot of gear that we got to check in. We got nearly 400 pounds of gear. We got to check in and fly to Dallas. So for that to be possible, we got to make sure that we not only get there, but it's basically because we're parking off site, we need to get there with enough time that everything's able to get checked in. So we figure, driving from Oakland to SFO, are we going to allot ourselves? I mean, we got to get there an hour early. So, uh, 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 carry the one. Let's get there at, let's leave at 8.30 for a, a 7.15 flight. No, 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 10.17 flight. Wow. Anyway, sorry, everybody, I'm having my morning stroke. So we figured that there might be some traffic. I mean, because here's the thing. It, going through San Francisco, it gets really, really slow in a hurry. It, it really is just a really uh, a slog coming in off the bridges because they bottleneck and stuff like that. So we get on the road, no traffic. No traffic at all. We're sailing through. We, you know, we're just doing donuts in the middle of 80, you know, on the Bay Bridge. We're just absolutely doing a three-point turn for no goddamn reason, just because there's nobody out there. It's a ghost town. Not really a ghost town, but there's no traffic. Long story short. Finally get out there, uh, get on the flight, get everything checked in. Everything's a pain in the ass to look around. And uh, we have a 30-minute turnaround in LAX which is where we're flying. We're flying from SFO to LAX to Dallas. LAX, of course, being the main airport in Los Angeles. So we're sitting on the runway, and we're just not taking off. And I know, because I'm, I'm watching my phone, which I'm supposed to have turned off, but seriously, fuck off with that. If, especially if you're making it sit on the fucking runway. Like, there's got to be a loophole. Somebody please pass... I mean, I, I want... Uh, a, I mean, I don't know if it's an FAA thing. Is it an FAA thing? Where it's like, I mean, I understand, okay, whatever. You have your bullshit rule about fucking putting it away before we get in the air, okay? That's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll swallow that. You know, everybody's got their thing. But when you're sitting on the fucking tarmac and you're not taking off and you've already told me to fucking put it away, like, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not going to not take out my phone. What am I going to do? Stare at the fucking weirdo next to me and just, you know, I don't know, play with his nose with my finger. Is that going to be what I'm going to do? No, I'm going to take out my phone and, and I'm going to check to make sure how bad my connecting flight is fucking me because you guys can't take the goddamn plane off. Now, meanwhile, the pilot is giving us like feedback on why we're not taking off. And here's why we're not taking off. Hey, uh, is the captain speaking? We're on an active runway. We, uh, could take off at any time. We are, uh, waiting to see how much baggage we have. Wait estimate, need a wait estimate before we take off. Not a hard problem to solve. Should have probably had it done by now. 
just waiting. Waiting for the weight estimate. Woo! And that's not exactly what he says, but it's basically what he says. And he comes on and gives three messages like that. Like that he's pissed off that these people can't get the fucking weight estimate done for us to, to take off in time. And meanwhile, all I am is just watching the digital sands in an hourglass of our connecting flight just kind of fall through. So I tweet out, there's nothing more frustrating than watching your connection disappear on the runway of the flight that you're taking off of. And unbeknownst to me, because I eventually turn off my phone and we take off. This is like a half hour late. Unbeknownst to me, Brian Brushwood, of course, partner, brother from another mother on NSFW, tweets me this like win one for the Gipper speech because this motherfucker travels all the time. He's like the traveling guy. He's on the road right now. So he tweets me this like, don't fucking just sit there, Justin. Go to the stewardess, talk to them, get the balls in, get the balls in motion. Like, you know, don't just hope for things to happen. Make a difference. Go out there and be somebody. Come on, man. Uh, and I don't get that until we land. But meanwhile, Brett, who's also a seasoned traveler, does talk to the stewardess. And he's like, listen, you know, we got these issues and, you know, we just need you. Is there any way that you can alert the L.A. flight that we're, like, landing? We're going to be, like, a few minutes late. But if they can just keep the door open, we can run to the other terminal and get on that plane. She's like, well, so you have a connection? Yeah. Uh, I, I just explained what the connection was. Hmm. Well, I'm going to need you to do me a favor and just go right to the gate. Now, Brett, and Brett's not a mean guy. It's a very, very nice guy. Laughs in her face. And and not like a, like, ah, ha, ha. Like, he's like, <laughs> like she's making a joke. Because that's what her voice is. Her voice box is making sounds reminiscent of a joke. As if she were trying to fuck with us. He's like, yeah, I, I was planning on doing that. And she's like, oh, okay, well... You know, because sometimes people go to the customer service desk, and that's not a good idea. No, you should just go right to the gate. It's like, well, can you alert them? No, we have no information. No way to contact them. No. Eh. So we're fucked. We get off the flight. We run as fast as we can with these fucking bags. And next thing you know, it's just like, oh, yeah. Like, we get there, and they're like, no, you're laughably late. You're hilariously late. So... Air travel bullshit aside, and this is why we had to do NSFW tonight as opposed to Tuesday, but it was because of all this cock up. We wound up going from Denver, or from LAX to Denver, Denver to Dallas. We get there, and there is no room. Now, all right, so basically we have another hotel screw up. We finally get to the hotel that we're going to stay in, that our ultimate destination. And... <laughs> we're talking to the lady there. We're like, listen, you have no idea, man. We've had so many fuck ups. Like, it has just been one fuck up after another. I am so excited that now, at the end of the night, we got up at fucking. I got up at six o'clock so I could write the blog before we got on the flight. And now it is fucking twelve central. So we're looking at two o'clock Pacific time. It's been nothing but solid, jam packed, but to ass to ass travel. And finally, we're here. We're here. And the lady's like, okay, here's your keys. We get up to the room, and there's one bed. <laughs> so we got to go all the way back down. That was just the one final, just punch in the ass. Like, like someone, like, the whole day was just a, a dude in an oddly fitting T-shirt just punching us, like, just really hard, right in the ass. Just like whack, ass punch, flack. Uh, and that was the last one. So we wind up staying there. And, and listen, this gig was great. I posted up on my Facebook and my Twitter a uh, picture of the set. We had full tuxedos. It was amazing. It was a great time. Uh, but that's that was my first travel, my first travel thing. And then eventually, here's the funny thing. On the way out, we're unloading stuff, and we need to get a, a cab with uh, a bunch of room 
to get our bags from the ho- the hotel where the event is to the hotel where we're staying. We come out there. This is the final thing. The final from from the ridiculous to the sublime. I'm like, listen, uh, I go to the cab stand. I'm like, we need a cab with a bunch of room in it. And so all of a sudden, this uh, hair stute gentleman toddles on over like he's hustling. He's looking to make a sale. And he's like, oh, I got you. I'm like, okay, well, what are you driving? I look over and it's a goddamn Hummer Z. <laughs> a stretched Hummer is sitting there. And he's like, he's like, oh, I'll take you to that hotel. Like same price as a cab. And so we end up getting the same price as a cab, except a Hummer Z is the shittiest way to transport things. It's like nothing but just one long uh, laser light enhanced corridor. (laughs) So we're just pushing these 80-pound bags filled with gear down to the end, like where the least popular kid at a bar mitzvah sits in this fucking Hummer scene. And, you know, that was it. We just Hummer zined all the way back to the Sheridan in downtown Dallas. Uh, so that's that's the Dallas story. Now, uh, these will not normally be just my travel stories. I'm not going to do that to you guys. But I felt like this one was pretty fun, and it's novel to me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to play a song. I'm going to try and get this goddamn chat working. And uh, then we will be back to talk about all of the movies coming out in the movie draft this week. And I'm going to go over a little bit about this NSFW thing, because it's going to be pretty fun tonight. It's going to be pretty fucking awesome. This is Jerry Friday, and this city's a mess. I said the whale. That was said the whale. This is Jerry Friday. My name is Justin Robert Young. Let's talk about the movies for the movie draft this weekend. Man, all right, things are starting to tighten up because finally all the players are on the board. Uh, and it has been like, the hottest and coldest summer ever. Normally, I, I, I say that this is about, uh, you know, the, the draft. You win or lose the draft based on your hits. And Brian's strategy has been that you don't win and lose based on your hits. You want to stockpile as many just cash, cash on hand. You just want to get as many cheap bargains as you can, stockpile them all, and try to try to run through with them. And, and don't go for the the fool's gold of the big super priced hits like for for example what you know would be the Hunger Games this time and Avengers Dark Knight Spider-Man stuff like that stuff that went for in our draft over like $40 that when you're when you're spending close to half of your haul on one movie you're kind of fucking up and that normally is fairly true however this year probably isn't because uh you know, Tom got the Avengers, and let's see, let's go ahead and take a take a fine little stroll down Avengers Alley and see how much that made. Five hundred and ninety million dollars. In context, we've got a, the rule of thumb is you need at least eight hundred million to win the league. He needs two hundred million from the rest of his films, which include Total Recall and Paranorman right now. So he just needs Total Recall and Paranorman to make two hundred million, which, you know, might not get him there. There might be, you know, Scott is still lurking. Scott has well, Scott's done. Scott's all all of his movies are spent. So Scott's kinda of fucked. Because he had the Hunger Games, Three Stooges, Snow White, and the Cuntsman, and uh that's my boy. And that was you know, that's not gonna happen. He's done with that. But he came close. He's sniffing. He's sniffing at Tom's Career end with uh, 592 million to Tom's 606 million. Which, by the way, let me just say this: I wish I was at Nerdtacular this weekend. Nerdtacular is going to be a goddamn blast, and I'm so furious that I can't be there. But uh, it just wasn't able to happen with getting all this stuff settled here. Now, meanwhile, Sarah, who is the other person who you kind of figure has got a got a shot at this because she's got the other 800 pound gorillas, two 800 pound gorillas. God knows why we're keeping both of them, because that's 1,600 pounds of gorilla running around, and who knows if anybody has that kind of stopping power. How much stopping power would you need to stop 1,600 pounds of gorilla? You'd probably need a lot of bullets. You'd need at least 1,700 bullets, and you'd shoot them at the gorillas, 
and maybe you'd be able to do something about it. I don't know where that was going. It was a funny thing in my head, and then it just got really unfunny. Her first movie, Rock of Ages, Sarah Lane, uh, debuted in 19 million. That's a crap. That's a crap house debut, especially for a movie with Tom Cruise. You figure, how much did she pay for that? Bup, 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 bup. Rock of Ages, she paid $10, which is not horrifyingly bad. But you know, for $10, you're looking at about $10 million per draft dollar. That's going to be a pile of butts that lands right in her lap. That's going to be 14 dirty butts taped together. And she's going to be like, what the fuck am I doing with this? That's what she's doing right now. She's in London, and she's just looking at a bunch of ta- butts taped together that has Rock of Ages scrawled in calligraphy on it. And she's like, what the fuck? Uh, but she still has The Dark Knight, which is going to be a gigantic monster. But what I was saying before is this, is, this year is about the hits. It's about the hits because only the hits are making money. The base hits, like the little maybe they do okay, they're not doing okay this year. They're doing like shit. It is the most hot and cold summer ever. It's because people are going out to the movies more so than they did last year. But this era is here to stay. Like, unless people are fucking excited to go out to the movies, they're not going to go out anymore. The era of people just being like, well, it's Friday. Oh, dear. What do you say we retire to the cinema? And you just, no, it'll just show up. I'll ask you this. Listen, this is colloquially. When's the last time you just went to the movies? And said, eh, we'll just see what's playing. Because that used to be a thing. You used to just be like, ah, let's just go to the movies. I want to see, I don't know, there's the movie where John Cusack solves a crime with a wig on. And then there's another movie where Steve Carell decides to make out with Keira Knightley. Or maybe not, I don't know. And then there's The Expendables 2 where Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis rub oil on each other. Mm, I don't know what starts like that used to be a thing. I don't think it's a thing anymore. I don't think people do that anymore. I would ask the chat room, but the chat room's fucked. Uh, you know, so people just go to movies they want to see. They're way more informed about it. I think now we just know what movies look like a total pile of shit. And so that's why Rock of Ages, I mean, Rock of Ages again, I talked about this last week. I don't understand what the fucking point of that was. Because you think you want Glee people to go, but, like, Glee people are young. Glee people don't want to remember the time that their mom may or may not have blown the bases from Def, Def Leppard. And that's, like, what that movie was all about. It was like, hey, remember the 80s when we fucking loved hair metal and we got drunk and made, you know, and then sang and danced about it. I just blew the bases from Def Leppard. Boom, bunch. Boom, bunch. So what comes out this week? Well, I'm glad you guys asked. It's a big week. We got three movies coming out this week, and one of which, I mean, this is really, if I'm if I'm going to have any kind of shot at this, which I don't. I don't have any shot at this. I'm fucked. As soon as G.I. Joe went out, I was fucked with a capital F. Uh, but here are the movies. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter getting huge reviews, big reviews. I think somebody, there was a great log line that I saw on one of the commercials that was 300 meets Sleepy Hollow, which, I mean, that that sounds like a pretty cool thing. I heard that, and I'm like, oh, fuck, man, that's a good way to describe that. I kind of want to go see that. Actually, I want to see all the all three of the uh, movies that are coming out. The next one is Brave, which, you know, we can talk a lot about Pixar, and, you know, they're kind of in a unfamiliar spot for Pixar, because... This movie is not getting rave reviews, and this is the second movie that has not gotten rave reviews for Pixar. You know, are we ready for a, for a world where Pixar just doesn't release brilliance every single summer? I don't know. Hopefully, people don't realize that it's not good if it isn't if it in fact is not good, and they just go see it because I would like to make the money, and I would like to be in this draft. Please, for God's sakes. I, if you could change your fate, would ya? I don't know. It just seems like a bad idea. Female lead, the crazy fucking Scottish accent. When's the last time that fucking Scottish accent made money? I don't know. Train spotting? God, 
I wish I had the chat room. They would, I'm sure they would have something. They'd like remind me something that I fucking didn't realize was like all Scottish people. I'm like, oh, you know, broadcast news that took place in Scotland. I'd be like, what? That make money? Why did I think of broadcast news? Uh, Brian's film this week is Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. Steve Carell, Karen Knightley. The weirdest thing about that one is that it's R. You, you watch those trailers and, and you watch the commercials and you think, like, what the fuck? Why did this need to be R? Not only for an R movie, it's like, hey, there's a lot of cursing. And Vince Vaughn talks about fingering somebody. Like, and, and also, there's a bunch of titties that show up. And maybe there are a bunch of titties. Maybe Vince Vaughn does come out at some point and talk about fingering somebody. But, like, it doesn't seem like it needs it. It seems like it's just kind of like it could be a PG-13 kind of edgy Steve Carell, Keira Knightley, you know, they're seeking friends for the end of the world. It's not like seeking titties or Vince Vaughn talking about fingering people at the end of the world. Friendship. That could be PG-13. Get more people in the theaters. I think, though, there was probably a script that was like one of those indie comedies, like like a little darker. Like maybe it ends in a, in a weird way that wasn't like really mainstream. And now all of a sudden it got a couple A-listers. Well, not a I guess, yeah, you could say Carell and Knightley are about as high profile as comedy stuff gets. And they're like, oh, well, we got to sell this. So we're going to sell it like a PG-13, but it's really going to be R. So I don't think that's going to make a whole lot of money. But, uh, you know, as far as weeks go, this is a fairly well-reviewed week so far. Let me take a look at the Rotten Tomatoes. Right now we are looking at, oh, wow, Jesus. Well, Abraham... Lincoln Vampire Hunter is getting the shit kicked out of it. I did not realize that. that yeah, it's getting a 36% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Brave is the best reviewed out of all of them. Way to go. Everything's coming up jury. And Seeking a Friend for the End of the World is at 52%. Which, comedies are usually fairly poorly reviewed. So, you know, you can usually add... My Rotten Tomatoes math is... You add 15% for horror movies, and 10% for comedies, because they don't translate very, very well to mainstream critics. So if you're going to say that, then Abraham Lincoln as, I mean, well, if we're characterizing that as a horror movie, which it does have vampires in it, then that adjusted is still only at like 41, uh, sorry, 51%, and Seeking Friend for the End of the World is at 62%, which does make it fresh in Rotten Tomatoes, if you are keeping track. And meanwhile, Brave, whew, I'll tell you what, man, man, that could be a good, hey, if, that's a, if that's a killer, I might be in this, oh no, I might be in this one just yet, you don't say, oh, uh, so that's, that's the movie draft, um, real quick, we don't normally do NSFW on Fridays, normally we do it on Tuesdays, but we're going to do it on, on Friday, tonight, and if you guys, for some reason, I can't fucking imagine there's anybody watching this that doesn't watch it or listen to NSFW. Or maybe you've kind of fallen out of watching or listening to NSFW. This is when you need to get back into it. Because we got something really cool. Something that could be very, very special. I mean, I'll have this guy's name on the podcast tonight. But many years ago, I'm talking about like 40 maybe 50 years ago, like in the 60s or early 70s, as the paperback romance novel Boom in America was really kind of in full bloom, there was a writer for, for the Long Island newspaper Newsday. He was like, you know, and this was around, the time, I guess it was around the time of the Vietnam War because he had to take a break in this project to go to the Vietnam War. He decided he wanted everybody in his newsroom to write chapters for a shitty romance novel. And his rules were, it can't be good, and it's got to be trashy. Much sex as possible, can't be well written. Hack it up. So the, the time frame in which this was going to happen kind of got expanded because he wound up going to cover, I believe it was the Vietnam War. Went out to cover the Vietnam War, came back, so it's like stretched over a bunch of years. But eventually, he gets all these things back, and they publish a romance novel with a romance novel cover that was made as a joke, as a complete joke, a lark, a hilarious jape. 
And this motherfucker was a bestseller. It was a huge hit. It was all about this woman on Long Island, a lonely housewife, who winds up fucking the entire island. And, like, you know, just has sex with all these ridiculous people. Clowns, gangsters, just all, just nonsense. Just absolute nonsense. And this was an absolute, an absolute hit. Again, this is where the chat would really come in handy, because somebody right now is Googling exactly what I need, and they'd be able to feed me the exact name. It shows me what a fraud I fucking am, that I can't operate without a chat room. <laughs> it's like half my brain's fucking unplugged. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this for one reason, friends. Tonight, we're going to do that. We're going to start the ball in motion, that we're going to recreate that Long Island newsroom over the internet, we are going to make a, or uh, lay out the chapters in the story, and everyone's going to submit a chapter for an erotic fiction book. Because right now, Brian figured out when it, uh, with the release of Scam School Book Two that the entire top fifteen is all romance novels now. Ever since Fifty Shades of Grey came out, everyone's like, these chicks are like, man, like I really enjoyed rubbing one out. To that fucking Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy. I would like to continue rubbing out shit on my iPad or Kindle. And so that's what they're doing. And you want to know what? <clears throat> Ladies, we're here for you. We are here for you. If there's nobody else here for you, we are here for you. Me, Brian, chat room. So we're going to do that tonight. We're going to lay out the story. Brett's going to be on the podcast. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be live from Petaluma. Me and Brett. Brian's going to be in Maine. And we're going to set up this uh, this goddamn erotic uh, <laughs> erotic fiction. It's going to be great. And so if you want to write, make sure you're here tonight. Uh, and uh, I think Brian went out and said that they're, uh, you know, to, to have some ideas. Have some ideas on, on, on what's going to happen. But we're going to, it's going to be similar to what we did with Scott Sigler, but on a bit more of a grand scale. And this time... You're the writer. All right. Well, you want to know what? I mean, I feel like there's really nowhere else to go with this episode. Um, you know, normally I can... Uh, yeah. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, I was getting a little feedback. I had opened up another chat window, or another instance of this page, so I could try to get the chat. And then all of a sudden, I heard my really annoying voice, and I'm like, oh, God, turn it off. Um, all right, well, you want to know what? I mean, I got a, we got a, we got a rock and roll. Normally, this is a very atypical episode of Jury Friday. This is a very jury-centric kind of episode of Jury Friday. Normally, I want to talk a little more about the news and everything, but... Between the chat room and, and everything else, that's it, just not to be. But I will be back next week. We will talk more about the news. We will have more information on this erotic fiction thing. This is going to be the best. If you guys are, you guys need to get in on this. You guys need to be here. Uh, it, it's going to be, well, let's see, let's take a look at the, the twit schedule and see when we're going to be on. Twit calendar. All right, we're on a 10 tonight. So make sure you are here. And uh, or you are on Twit. And we'll, we'll figure it out. But, and then also, real quick. Let me just go ahead and let everybody know. Uh, real quick, I say the sports talk for the end so people can just stop listening. I was very excited last night because my uh, my I've only rooted for two basketball teams my entire life. I'm not a basketball guy. Way more of a hockey guy, way more of a football guy. Uh, but I've only ever rooted for two basketball teams. Growing up in South Florida, I rooted for the Miami Heat uh, of the Tim Hardaway, Alonzo Mourning variety. Those teams that got into, you know, the, the benches clearing brawls with the, the New York Knicks in the mid-90s. I very much enjoyed those teams. I liked watching them. And then I rooted for the Syracuse Orange men. I guess they were the Orange men then. 
uh, when they won the national championship and I was going to Syracuse. It's the only two teams I ever rooted for because basketball is my thing. I don't really like it. So a couple years ago, uh, the Heat got LeBron James. I always kind of followed the Heat, but they weren't like my thing, my thing. Uh, they got LeBron James and Chris Bosh. I started paying a lot more attention to them because obviously they're a good team. They're an exciting team. That's all everybody wanted to talk about. And I was very excited last night when they beat the Oklahoma City Thunder to win the uh, NBA championship. LeBron James got the MVP. He absolutely played insane. There's Here's what I'll tie it back to. It's kind of a universal thing. I don't want to talk about sports and break down X's and O's because I don't fucking know about basketball. I can try and say. I can say LeBron James is really good. The other team was not very good. Um, and it seemed like the Heat got a lot of unexpected performances out of role players that have historically underperformed for the last two years. And as a fan watching that, that's my analysis. Boom, there's a bow on it. But let me just leave you guys with why sports is kind of important or how sports was, was important to me. Now, I just moved across the country. I, I love South Florida. South Florida is is my will always be my place, will always be my hometown. I don't think I've ever listened to as much Florida sports talk radio than I have since I lived in California. (laughs) Since I can no longer get it on radio, I've listened to more Florida sports talk radio via podcast than I ever have. I've never in my life, despite the fact that I like the team, and I've watched, uh, you know, probably out of the 82 games in a season, I probably watched 40 games a season for the Heat for the last two years. I've never bought a t-shirt until I moved to California and I wanted to have a t-shirt that said the heat on it. Um, But that's what, that's why sports kind of matters, I think. Is that for me, it was a way that I could express how much I missed my hometown. And it was something that I could talk to my friends back home uh, about at a moment's notice. You know, it was an icebreaker so I could keep in touch with the people that I cared about. Uh, and and wouldn't feel just awkward saying, hey, what's going on? Like immediately we can start a conversation because I can talk about how much I enjoy Chris Chris Bosh and how much he looks like, as Brett said last night, a cartoon condor. Uh, I like to call him a handsome brontosaurus. Um, Or I can text my friend Mike and say that James Harden is black Abraham Lincoln possession killer because he is uh, he was absolutely terrible last night and has been for the majority of the series. But that's that's what matters. You know, I mean, yeah, you can give a fuck about sports, and that's fine. I mean, you can dig sports, you cannot dig sports. But for me, it matters. It matters that I was able to talk to my friends. It matters that I was able to just text my brother. And now, you know, even across the country, we could kind of share even that one scintilla of a moment I think that's cool I think you're cool I think it's cool that you came and watched me on this episode of Jerry Friday normally they're longer normally I talk about politics normally I talk about news and we will get back to all that next week but until then my name is Justin Robert Young please don't die